there, not just before the, uh, um, the, the beginning of COVID uh, crisis in March, I was there. Um, love your country, by the way, and your city. Looking forward to coming back there in a few months, hopefully. But we're in 50 countries and we do have schools that we're partnering with right there in Cairo. And uh, we really recognize the critical nature of technology and in infrastructure and helping overcome complex problems. And one of those problems is the thing that we're talking about today here with uh, the adaptation and, and modification of learning uh, and delivery, instructional delivery. So we are um, a global company and we operate local in, in the markets where we are. As you know, Radwa mentioned that they are our strategic partner in Egypt and uh, they are our uh, channel partner there for helping schools with our solutions. We provide a core SIS product uh, that may be already something that you've come to um, be aware of, but we have a core student information system that's been on the market about two decades. We wrap around that lots of services that are relevant to schools. And now more than ever, families are wanting to apply and enroll from a distance, uh, pay from a distance, um, they want to, you know, have a more holistic management environment that includes learning delivery systems like um, uh, LMS platforms, Google Classroom is a common one, Canvas, Schoology, Moodle. Uh, these are products that we integrate into our total solution. So we have a great um, experience that we can provide for schools. And obviously that helps put them in a position where they can be effective at um, generating some of the outcomes that are being called upon by schools now for their families. So this just gives you a view into some of the scope and sequence of what we offer. So we are a, a system that is flexible, uh, intuitive. Uh, we've got a responsive design, dashboarding, mobile family centric, which is critical now. And um, that is something that we're talking with schools every day about. So I'll mention that just at the conclusion of today's discussion, but I wanted to make sure that you understood who FACS is and the role that we can potentially play in helping be a strategic partner to schools with all the needs that they have uh, given where we are today in uh, 2020 going into 2021. So we're gonna bring the panel in now for our discussion. Uh, we're still waiting on Corolla. We'll greet her when she comes, but we're gonna start out uh, with you, Michael. Actually, Mark, before you start with me, I noticed Corolla has just uh, joined us, so ah. you can introduce her. Good, she's uh, coming along here. We'll see her. There she is. So there's Corolla and uh, you mentioned, uh, or you heard me mention at the top of the discussion that uh, she was going to arrive. She's in Madrid, Spain, and Carol is the brilliant one. We love having her on our panels, and she is today responsible for about 160 schools that we partner with and uh, has a wealth of experience and uh, is uh, well versed on the topics that we're going to be talking about here today and is a, a school, a consultant to schools for school management and solutions. So Carola, welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, everyone panel. Looking forward to this session today. Great. Thank you, Michael, for the cue. So Michael, we're gonna turn uh, our attention to you right now. And I'd like you to set up the big picture stage for our listeners, for us. You're a global figure in instructional design and this conversation about distance learning began well before COVID pandemic showed up. And you've seen schools that are just getting started with remote learning. You've witnessed schools that are well embedded and thriving in that model. So I wondered if you could just give us an overview that can help our schools and, and teachers and leaders that are on the, pan, on the webinar here with us today, uh, some confidence about the fact that there is an opportunity here. They can be successful, shine brightly post pandemic, embracing uh, distance learning into their overall mission. So time is yours, Michael, here. Perfect. Thank you. And if you could stop sharing there, I'll grab the screen from you. There we go. Thank you. All righty. So yeah, so um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of the things I've seen happening around uh, the the world, and but first I, I want to point out some terminology that we want to um, discuss because I think it's an important one. And I was listening into the first session that we had this morning, and I remember the uh, the gentleman who was the principal from the school in Singapore used the term emergency remote teaching or emergency remote learning. And as soon as he did, it brought a smile to my face because I think it's important that we distinguish some of these things. And in particular, um, the term emergency remote teaching was really um, delineated by um, Chuck Hodges and, and his colleagues in this particular article. And as soon as I finish and get back to the chat, I'll uh, post the link to this article in there. But they distinguish between online learning and emergency remote learning. Um, basically, this was the definition that they had for online learning. And I'm not going to read it to you, but I do want to highlight some of the specific terms that they use. You know, purposeful instructional planning, systematic model, careful consideration, best suited, purposeful selection, careful planning, appropriately trained. You can see how this is a really a, a, a thought out kind of process. Whereas if you look at the way in which they describe emergency remote teaching, what you see when you highlight some of these words here, you know, it's a temporary shift and it's due to crisis circumstances and that we're gonna go back to the way that things were once the crisis is over. You know, and we're not trying to cre recreate the robust um, system that we had in the classroom. This is just a temporary thing and it's going to be quick and reliably available, but that's about it. Right. And I think that's the big difference between these two environments here. You know, folks like yourself who are coming to a session like this, who are thinking this through, you guys, I think, are looking at what's been happening in all of these remote teaching contexts and thinking to yourself, okay, if I had the chance to sit down and plan this through and to decide what tools I wanted to use and, and how I wanted to go about offering curriculum and what mediums that I wanted to use, you want to really make the transition from that remote teaching more to an online teaching environment. And, and I think that's an important distinction to have because, you know, if we look at the history of pandemics and, you know, we've been having them now for millennia, at least in terms of a recorded sense. Um, one of the things that we know is that historically we've had usually one or two a century. And it's important to underscore the fact that, uh, you know, COVID-19 is the fifth pan global pandemic that we have had this century. You know, so we've gone from having them once every 50 to 80 years to now having them every five to eight years. And that's a big difference because it's something that, you know, we really have to prepare for. And it's not a new thing, to be honest with you. You know, this was an article that was published by um, the 74 million, um, which is an online uh, publication where they were describing a education at home program in Long Beach, California, that was being used during the Spanish flu pandemic. And in this case, they were actually using a radio and um, or sorry, not radio, a telephone system to provide education. And their biggest problem was telephones were only around for about 20 years at that point. So they were overloading the system when they were doing this. Um, if you look back to, you know, the polio epidemic in New Zealand, their correspondence school, Takura is the, the Maori name for their correspondence school, were used when all of the schools in New Zealand closed. And, you know, that's what, 78, yeah, 70 years ago. Um, even if you look, you know, this was an article or a, a proceedings that I wrote back 10 years ago in 2010. And one of the things I'll highlight in there is, you know, I make the reference that, you know, Singapore was a country at the time that their public school system used to close for a week at a time to prepare for, and it's the last line there, to prepare the K-12 system for pandemic or natural disaster forced closures. You know, so this is something that's not necessarily new to us. So it really shouldn't have taken us by surprise when it happened. You know, we've been using some of these distance technologies now for 100, over 100 years in the K-12 system. And, you know, we should have been better prepared because um, what you saw happening in the spring, and I'm sure this is, is probably akin to many of your own experiences, you saw teachers that were taking over, you know, parts of their kitchen or parts of their bedroom, or in this case, parts of their garage to make 
create makeshift classrooms so that they could continue to provide instruction online. For students that didn't have access to online learning, we were so ill prepared that you had teachers that drove to kids' homes and actually put you know, math problems in the chalk in their driveway or actually stood outside their doors to you know, teach them through the storm door that they had there because we were just so ill-equipped for this. You know, and when you look at sort of how this is played out um, across the, in this case, it says North America, but really it's the world, you know, in those first few weeks after schools closed, you know, that's that phase one where we were really in that emergency phase, you know, and it was really important for us at that point to just do whatever we could to provide some continuity of learning and whatever teachers did in March and April and even into May, hats off to them. I think they did exceptional jobs because they, you know, it was an incredibly stressful situation for everyone and they did a yeoman service. What should have started happening near the end of the spring and particularly as we went into the summer for those year round schools and into the fall for us in North America and, and, and in Western Europe, we should have started planning a little bit better because we knew that as we started to do this a little bit better and we started to provide some of the tools, um, when the second wave hit, and that's when you're starting to get into phase three here now, you know, there's going to be times where you're going to be able to do stuff in the classroom. Then there's going to be times where either as a system, maybe just regionally, countrywide, you're going to have to close down again and it's going to bounce back and forth. And that's why the line kind of goes like this. And then it takes us to sort of today's conversation, you know, when we get out of this, what's this all going to look like, you know, and how is this going to change what we do in the K-12 system? Um, because there were some folks that really were set up well for this. You know, South Korea has a cyber home learning system where the government has essentially established a learning management system and student information system that's available to all students. Um, they have tutors that are available that are there outside of traditional school hours. Um, all students have access to them. And what ends up happening, and the reason they did it was because they were trying to essentially provide tutorial access for students to reduce um, the socioeconomic gap that existed. But teachers started using this with their own students. So everyone was familiar with the system. So when they had to close down, they had a system in place that the government had provided that they could just transition to. And you know, admittedly, they are a highly connected society. You know, in places that weren't, you had paper packets and books being sent out to kids through the old postal mail system. Um, in the case of Australia, you had their schools from the air that were using radio broadcasts to continue to provide education because those schools of the air still operate today, even though some of them are as old as 80 years old at this point. Um, throughout here in, in the US, we saw lots of examples where school districts partnered with their local television stations to essentially give up their daytime soap operas and replace them with educational programming that students could have access to. You know, so we saw a lot of, of, of examples of this and we started to think that we might be okay coming into the fall because but we forgot about the fact that pandemics come in waves and we didn't quite know what the waves would look like and when they would hit, but they come in waves. So everyone, and, and this isn't just true for this year, but I think it's true in going forward, needs to be ready for three kinds of teaching situations. And this is Brian Alexander, who uh, wrote an op-ed for the, the Wall Street Journal, um, talking about you know, that idea of how do we teach if we can go, come to campus or come to school? How do we teach if we're entirely remote? Or how do we teach if we've got to flip back and forth between the two throughout a given term or a given school year? And those are the types of plans that we want to make right now, because at least here in North America, I mean, and when the fall rolled around, this is what we saw, you know, instances where students just couldn't access the online learning. You know, in this case, the, the kid apparently has to walk three miles to access the internet at his school because he doesn't have it at home. You know, these two kids here in California, where I'm located, are outside of a fast food place to take advantage of their free Wi-Fi, um, you know, and when it comes to actually what we're doing, even though you have access, it doesn't necessarily means, mean that you know how to use those tools effectively to address the social emotional aspects of, 
um, what the students are facing. And beyond the fact that, you know, we're going to be in this for a while, you know, you have to consider the, the impact that this has, not just on students, but on the entire educational system. You know, this is an ongoing study that Education Week has been doing that's been looking at the morale of students, teachers, hourly staff, and then administrators. And you can see the percentage of people in each of those categories that believe that morale has gone down. And this is obviously an American study, but over the summer, you can see most of them got a little bit optimistic. And you know the percentage of people that said morale had declined actually decreased significantly. But then as soon as school started again, you saw them reaching new heights in all of those areas. And regardless if we're thinking about the next pandemic or the next major school closure, we have to forget we're not out of this pandemic yet. You know, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's the, the head of the Infectious Disease Center at the National Institute of Health, you know, has basically said that it's going to be the end of 2021 or even early 2022 before we come back to any sense of normalcy. So that's a full year from now. So we're not just talking about this school year. We're talking about next school year as well. You know, Teresa Tam, who's the chief public health officer in Canada, told Canadians in July that they should expect to live with the current inconveniences, things like having to mask, things like having to social distance, limiting the number of contacts that you have and the number of people in indoor spaces for the next two to three years. You know, so that would be until July of 2022 or July of 2023. You know, so this is not a short term thing. So we don't want to be in the situation where the next time this happens, when the next wave comes through, that we find ourselves back in phase one. Um, you know, we want to get to a position where we're all in that phase three area where we're prepared to be able to bounce back and forth, depending upon what's happening. And I think, um, you know, the things that you're getting from the conference today and over the next couple of days, and for that matter, in the next hour of this session, I think will be helpful in that. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Corolla is 100% uh, Latina, but if you uh, listen carefully, you might hear a Canadian accent come through with some of our other speakers here today. So great overview there, Michael. And, um, you know, one of the things that struck me about your comments is that there is that absolute possibility of the recurring nature and the fr in increased frequency of disruption due to ongoing pandemics. And um, that in and of itself is um, a reality check. It's holding us accountable and keeping us earnest to uh, strategy. And uh, I know that we've got a very group of listeners on our webinar today. We've got leaders and we've got instructional professionals. So we're trying to balance this out and, and provide some insights from all sides of this comp. <clears throat> this conversation. And I want to turn to you, Carola, uh, with that. You, as I mentioned, are involved in, in helping <clears throat> a large number of schools, 160 schools every day. There's a couple of schools that come to mind that uh, we have in our uh, portfolio of, of, of customers, clients, uh, Hawk Academy in Karachi, uh, Pakistan, the King Mankut International Demonstration School in Bangkok. And uh, wondered if you could just comment on what you see and how some of these schools that really are truly best practice schools. And we've got some case studies on the schools that I've just mentioned that we can share with our audience post webinar uh, so that you can read into their script uh, that they are following for change and, and adaptation. But uh, Carol, take a few minutes here and just share some of your insights with regard to that. Thank you, Mark. Yes, this has been really a very interesting, interesting period for us because we had been working with schools around the world in the normal time. And then suddenly we were faced with 160 clients that were facing, well, this abyss. So um, it's really interesting, these two schools, one of them, the Kangmangut, was very prepared. They had all their LMS ready. It's more of a STEM school. So they were ready for just switching into online, offline. So it's, it's nice to know that you can help those that are already ready with little tools that'll make it easier for communication with parents, with um, teachers through with administrators 
The one that was really, in our um, view, amazing was Karachi, the hack economy, because they literally purchased facts at the beginning of the year. They went live in March. So we're re really looking at a school that was taking baby steps into the school information system. They had previously used, they were very technological. So they had a proprietary school administration software. They, they were tech savvy, but they didn't really have this full rounded um, LMS and well, team that would help them. So they went live in March. And when they had to go online, well, instead of having this big chaos scenario, the director took her teams and just showed them how it was going to be done in the future. So they did the little immediate um, response, learning how to use the LMS and just using the tools that they had just purchased to deliver content online. Now, of course, there are always some paradigms that have been broken. There's always little um, well, problems here and there, but all in all, with good management and with teaching staff that accommodates all this new learning, and well, they, they've really been the, the wizards of all this. They were able to thrive in the first month, a couple of months, and they have, uh, I think, about 80% um, of families that when faced upon the choice of going online or offline in September, they chose to stay online because they really liked the experience. Now, what things did the, did the administration do? What did the teachers do? They took a very personal approach. So the teachers made sure not just to deliver content online, but they also met in smaller groups and had one-to-one -one contact. Teachers love teaching. I mean, we, we really like having our students in front of us. So they made sure that they had smaller groups and did that well-being. So at the end, the school is delivering their content in a certain way. Students are feeling accompanied and well, it's working. It really is working. So what they are struggling, well, not struggling, what they are right now considering is what other tools can they bring on board? Because like Michael said, we're this far, first wave, second wave. This will continue in a way, hopefully not as bad as it was at the beginning, but They've learned a lot. Teachers have learned in tremendous, their learning curve, and now they're teaching other schools. But what can they do for the future? Well, they're looking at other technologies, how they can support all this blended learning model, and, and also how to keep on engaging students, because students have also learned tremendously in all this. They know, they little, not preschoolers, but elementary kids, they know how to use this technology. So how can they enhance their independence? How can they engage them more? How can they grow in autonomy in all this? And well, how can they continue with that one-to-one -one approach live and, um, and online? So I think we're all in the learning curve, but we can learn from these schools that were either all equipped and faced it with a lot of strength or those that were just starting and what did they do? they worked together. They worked together, they worked, worked um, with technologies and they um, always took into consideration that their mission is educate those little bright minds of the future. So I'm sure that many educators are out there in the similar situation, sometimes not facing the best technology, maybe not having the best internet bandwidth, but it can be done as we can see from so many, so many case studies, not only these two that I have, but we have we know so many schools that have struggled, but they got they got stronger from all this. Thank you, Caroline. You know, I'm sitting here listening, and uh, I'm imagining our listeners that are on the webinar here with us today, and <clears throat> at various intervals of this conversation, I'm sure that they're nodding their heads because we can relate to what is happening to us. It was interesting. I uh, received an uh, email from ECIS. Some of you may be uh, familiar with, or even have attended their conferences, the Educational Collaborative for International Schools, ECIS. And Ian Salas on the 29th of November last month uh, wrote a short article and he was uh, looking at uh, schools in Malaysia and uh, some of the things that they're learning. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the three tenets that he talked about in his uh, discussion was the need to care for each other. And that's been articulated a couple of times during 
uh, this session here. And uh, he, he highlighted particularly, you know, having pastoral staff, counselors, tutors that are online and that are helping care for the well-being of the learners. And that is something that maybe we haven't as um, assertively integrated into the learning environment in what we would have called traditional on-site learning. But it is a, a good reminder that that has to be also a part of our strategy that we have. And, and in fact, in the session just before this one, I heard one of the attendees raise that question because families and students, they were disengaged and how do they get them engaged and activated and, and excited about learning? So I want to turn to you, Blake, now for a few moments. And it wasn't the pandemic that ushered in distance learning in the Northwest Territories. You manage distance learning for the Northern communities in Canada who otherwise might not have equity um, in the same way that uh, uh, regions that have more ready access to education would have. So talk to us a little bit about that. And how do you decide pedagogy and measure success um, from a student outcome perspective? Let us know your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, uh, panelists. I've been listening with great interest. Um, I'm going to try to fit a, a lot into my little 10 minutes here. Um, we're feeling the pressures of the dynamics of distance learning right here now today because I can't see the learners or the, the listeners. I can't see what kind of visual cues you are displaying. So we are feeling these tensions even in this meeting or in this uh, panel. Uh, if Michael has spoken to a very broad context, uh, an overview, I will be speaking perhaps a bit like Corolla to more very specific context of, of distance learning. And uh, I think you'll hear me repeat some of the themes that you've heard so far, but uh, my remarks will probably fit into two kind of large buckets, if, if you will. One is uh, regarding uh, a distance learning program that's run by a government. So you're going to hear me talk about uh, distance learning decisions that are being made as a result of human demographics and, uh, and the geography of a place. And perhaps then also you'll hear about uh, distance learning being uh, sort of a political decision uh, made sometimes in legislative processes. And that those two buckets affect uh, our distance learning approach here in the Northwest Territories. Thank you for putting the, the uh, map up. You can see that uh, uh, it's helpful, maybe it's helpful for you to understand some of what I'm gonna say by seeing where I'm from. And I'm from Northern Canada, which really is, uh, it's a cold and beautiful place like Scandinavia, uh, those of you who know Northern Europe. And uh, like today, our sun is rising at 10 and it's setting at three. So we have limited sunshine each day here. Uh, uh, COVID, I seem to be hearing this brought up, of course, and uh, we've only had uh, 15 cases of COVID in our territory of 40,000 people. So we're doing something right. Uh, in, in that regard, our students are still attending schools, but they are attending with restrictions. And uh, as with quite a few places in Canada, but uh, perhaps the least restrictions here in our territory. Uh, we see that within flow within the buildings, uh, the number of students that are permitted in a class at a time. Uh, because of that, there's shifts going on in the school plant. And the PPE that students have to wear in, in um, congested areas. Uh, I'm not speaking about strange things, I'm sure, to, to our listeners. But uh, in our territory, because we're so remote, uh, we have small student populations in our small community high schools. We have some regional centers as well, but they are the... Um, they're almost the anomaly, even though they have a lot of our population. Uh, we have 20 small remote community high schools. And uh, this is gonna be hard for some folks to understand, but in those communities, they can't offer a full uh, 
a complement of courses. And so sometimes they blend uh, curricula in a same classroom uh, with the same teacher. For instance, uh, a standard social studies course and an academic social studies course might be happening in the classroom at the same time. And, uh, or some of the most difficult courses are actually cycled or they're not offered at all. In some of our schools, we don't have chemistry uh, offered in the, at the high school level. Again, in these small community schools. And uh, so in order to access and make up the difference for these kind of courses, uh, there's sort of a digital correspondence school in a nearby province that our students can attend uh, through their local high school. Um, however, the local high schools tend not to put resources into uh, supporting those kinds of uh, programs and they sort of leave it to parents and students to, to develop their own sense of agency, if you will. And so the program is not that popular and it's not that successful. And if you would show Mark the map of the NWT. Uh, so I'm part of a team that uh, is managing a small but growing distance learning solution that's run by our territorial government. Uh, it's called Northern Distance Learning. And maybe if I describe this a little bit, you'll see some of the decision making that goes into uh, our solution. And I hope it rings true with some of you. Uh, our program makes live courses available to Indigenous students who live in remote communities. And some of these communities don't have a road into them. You can only get to them by a plane or by a road over ice in the wintertime. And uh, some of the students in uh, the live course cohorts are as far away from each other as 1,200 kilometers and yet they get to experience the diversity of being with each other. Our host community is the red dot on the map. It's on the Arctic Circle, and it's in a place called Anuvik, 66 degrees north of the equator. Uh, one of the questions you asked was who decides the pedagogy? Uh, in our um, solution, the Northern Distance Learning teachers work as a community to determine online practices and pedagogies. And they're guided by a local coordinator. And our pedagogies, though, are intentionally shaped by principles of education renewal that we are undergoing. And we call them foundational statements. And I know some many jurisdictions around the world are looking in the 21st century as to how to renew and make more engaging their, their education, and we are as well. You asked, what is success for us? Uh, we look at dimensions of success that include uh, perhaps one, just simply being able to offer a course that's rigorous from a distance, be able to have the infrastructure to make that happen. That in itself is a starting point for us to be able to use communication collaboration tools and a over a point-to-point -point, um, network. Uh, we, of course, are looking at uh, the amount of high school credits that are earned as a result of our programming. Uh, we're paying attention to the extent of student engagement. That is, all, that is often one of the sacrifices made uh, in an online environment. You cannot be 100% sure about the level of engagement. And then it's key for us, maybe our fourth one here is the quality of human presence that we're able to maintain between all the stakeholders, the parents, the students, the principals, the teachers, the coordinators. What is the quality of that presence? And presence is even really key right now in a COVID environment because students are being separated from people they dearly love in their lives, those are teachers, some of the most impactful individuals. Uh, our courses are offered to students who plan to attend post-secondary institutions because again, they cannot get these courses in their local communities. 
Now, 99% of our students are indigenous. They're, uh, and their communities uh, are shaping the values that we build into our program. Again, the political side of distance learning. One is the values is that students learn together in a community rather than alone and in isolation. Another is supported learning where all the stakeholders uh, needs are being considered. And thirdly is, yes, the development of student agency and um, a blend of live classes as well as the use of uh, LMSs and all of those great learning objects that are placed there for students on demand. Uh, so our government uh, has certain, has mandated, in fact, these values. Um, number one, our government says we need to redress the history and legacy of residential schools uh, and how they've impacted Indigenous people in our territory. Uh, and that involves one large word that I think Mark used in the introduction, that is the use of the word equity. And it's our mandate to provide an equitable experience uh, for students in small communities and that a student's future uh, prospects should not be determined by their geography. Uh, we, we refer to the tyranny of geography. <laughs> And if students in our regional centers can enjoy uh, live classes with among peers of similar abilities and interests, we believe that our students in our small communities should be able to experience those same kind of opportunities. As far as the future is concerned, yes, COVID has come along and has thrown up the charts, if you will, the notion of learning from a distance. Uh, we are looking forward to phases in our Northern Distance Learning Program that will, that will enjoy some of those more asynchronous features that you're all familiar with, and that is the choice of place, time, and pace over learning. Uh, and at that time, we would involve more regional centers, uh, students in those settings as well. As far as COVID is concerned, how is that uh, affecting both our brick and mortar and our distance learning at this time? Um, we're investing more money in our digital infrastructure, both territorially and federally. Um, it's just a matter of equity to be able to, to learn from a distance and to register your car for, from a distance, if you will, basic government services. Um, we notice that restrictions have forced teachers into blended technologies, whether they're emergency based as Michael was referencing or not. Uh, we are being forced to address uh, learning curves that technologies have always presented, but now the, the reticent are being forced into these environments. Uh, that is uh, increasing the level of stress among teachers and we have uh, significant amount of teachers that are that are considering their longevity in the field of education because of uh, this environment. Uh, also, there's an increased emphasis on LMSs, and when whether you're live or whether you're on demand, the 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 real benefits of having some of your best learning objects in those kind of places. Uh, I'm almost done here. I hope I'm within my time. Uh, we're also uh, noticing the there's some silver linings to COVID. Uh, one is that uh, that we're studying what are the benefits of being online. Uh, there are considerable amount of them, and uh, they've always existed, but now we're giving them some some airtime, uh, incredible airtime. Uh, for our program, Northern Distance Learning, we are thinking anew about how we can engage with alumni from uh, in our Northern Distance Learning program. How can we bring those individuals to uh, or orientations? How can we have virtual conferences between stakeholders to overcome those those uh, those uh, personal uh, presence issues. And 
how can we do more virtual in-servicing with our, our teachers? You can see that our teachers are far from, even from us down here in Yellowknife, I'm way down at the bottom of that map and the teachers are up at the red dot. Um, so in conclusion, our climate and our geography and now COVID uh, cause Northerners in, in this environment to be resilient, to build resilience. And, uh, and that in itself is always a work in progress as we've been hearing about uh, these other jurisdictions making adjustments. Thank you. Well, thank you, Blake. Uh, the one thing he failed to mention to you is it's a hot day in Yellowknife. It's just minus four centigrade. So uh, that is extremely warm. And I'm sure that you and Cairo are happy with your 20 Celsius today. Uh, thank you, Blake. That was good insights. And uh, actually, it is quite interesting to understand that there are geographies on our planet that have been reliant upon um, strategies and, and practices that, you know, other parts of our globe are just now confronting uh, earnestly for the first time. Uh, we're going to have to be a little uh, adaptive ourselves here during the webinar. We've only got about 10 minutes left and I'm um, going to kind of bring us together around uh, <clears throat> a question, but I want to just underscore uh, something that I really do believe is, is critical. And Corolla, I'm gonna ask you to literally take just like one minute or so on this. Uh, and that is the infrastructure mm -hmm. really, and Blake, you mentioned this, how critical in nature the infrastructure is. And it was quite interesting to me uh, that you know, we've got a school like the uh, King Mankut School in Bangkok, who is actually increasing their school enrollment because they're putting forward a constructive and valuable experience for students and families. And so suddenly they don't have physical boundaries, just like you talked about, Blake. They're, that is erased. Now their classroom, their student, um, their, their student body can literally be anywhere. I mean, this goes without saying, but I challenge our, our, our attendees today to think about this, of not just surviving, but what does thriving international schools look like into the future and how magnetic can they provide an experience that will be compelling and interesting to families everywhere, that, that piece. And then the second bit, and you alluded to this, Blake, and that is that what, are the, what is the value of remote learning? And in fact, the school in, in Karachi, Hawk Academy, one of the things that they started studying and noticing was that students were more successful. They had students that were now more successful academically learning from a distance than they had historically been in classroom. What is that? What are we learning there? And how are we giving attention and study to that? I think is a challenge for our listeners. So Corolla, infrastructure is king. If we're going to be adaptive, if we're gonna see the cycles that Michael talked about of recurring pandemics, if we're going to become a be better best practice like the North, uh, as you've indicated, Blake, infrastructure is king. And, and you see this every day, just a minute uh, or so, Corolla, please. Sure, thank you, Mike. Infrastructure is critical. You need to have those four wheels, that LMS. You need to have your good bandwidth at school. You also need to help families have that or find a way to get computers, cell telephones. There are so many ways to follow on online learning. It doesn't have to be a computer. Um, but infrastructure, I think most schools had something set for high school, but not for elementary and not for lower grades. So this has been really revolutionizing the way schools work, that this elementary school teacher had to use four wheels, had to use the LMS to transmit all her knowledge. So it's infrastructure and it's teaching them, teaching all your teachers how to use it and how yep. to feel comfortable in it. And once the elementary catches up to the high school, that's a very concrete way of seeing it, then the whole school can move together because you have siblings in a family, many three times sometimes, and communication. So when a school provide, has enough communication bandwidth, that is that their school management system provides a total communication, parents know exactly what page they have to flip and help their kid who's on the telephone today. 
they know exactly what teacher they have to ping to know if they she's going to turn in her assessments or not. So this infrastructure that Mike is talking about is really just having a very powerful database, a good, 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 uh, good strength that will allow many different programs to run on it. And when it runs on it, it, has, it, it training has to go with it. So most of the yeah. time, these schools that are hurting because their teachers were a little reluctant to use their technology. So just go out there, teach them. And teachers love teaching. So once they see that the technology actually helps them uh, reach their goals, they're going to be using it and showing us how to use mm. it. So, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think it's a great encouragement there. And I know that infrastructural um, uh, uh, capitalization of infrastructure is a decision that's made above teacher pay grade. And we've all been there. I'm a practitioner, a previous head of school. I, you know, I understand how this works. But the actual catalyst of the learning, that is the genius of that is at the instructional level. And Michael, I want to bring you back in. And we've got our group here, panel, we have um, about seven minutes uh, left here, five, six, seven minutes. Michael and Blake Carroll, I want to really focus for the teachers that are on this uh, webinar today, talking about uh, a couple of concepts and, 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 and details around reshaping curriculum and, and outcome and assessment. Uh, lead us down that path a little bit, please. We have you there, Michael. Oh, okay. I didn't, you yeah. named Sorry. all three of us, so I didn't know yeah, who no, you wanted to start. You. It's you. It's you, my friend. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think the first thing that we want to do is, you know, remember that the, the act of teaching and learning is basically the, the interaction and relationship that we have with our students. And, you know, the, regardless of the setting you're in, if it's a highly connected one with lots of infrastructure or one where you're struggling with a lot of that digital um, infrastructure, finding tools and ways to create that connection and that relationship is key. Um, and then using the tools that you have available to you, be them digital or otherwise, to figure out how can we measure whether or not a, a, a student has learned what it is that we're trying to get across, I think is, is the, the next challenge. And um, I, I'll be honest and say, I'm not as familiar with, with Egyptian, um, the Egyptian education system to know if they've gone down the standardized model that we see in North America, but I'm hoping that they haven't because that means they're more progressive than what we are and that they're actually measuring what I would consider real learning as opposed to just the memorized facts that someone can, you know, highlight on a, a multiple choice quiz and, and looking at, um, you know, I can upload a, or I can create an e-portfolio if I have digital tools. By the same token, I can, um, you know, use my cell phone and turn the video thing on and walk my teacher through a, a physical portfolio that I've got. I can take a, a digital camera or for that matter, even an old Polaroid camera and take pictures of the physical portfolio that I've created and mail them back to my teacher. Um, you know, it's the portfolio part I think is the key, the tool that we use to communicate that I, I think is less important. Yeah, I, it's interesting. Uh, there was a question that popped up here for the panel. How can we use the digital infrastructure to better assessment and uh, one of the things that I think we've seen is that increasingly schools are looking at um, standards, the embedding of standards, standards-based assessment, uh, 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 customized rubrics, and uh, you want your system to be able to do that. The FACT system, in fact, can uh, embrace and upload uh, standards, and we've got lots of different variations of those that are at work in our global schools. But I think it's re that is really critical for teachers where they're, that, the heavy lifting of that is done in the background on the enterprise system itself, the digital platform, and, and you're just engaging it at the assignment level, at the course level, so that you can track um, more effectively uh, uh, student learning, mapping, mapping their learning and outcomes uh, is good there. Um, other thoughts from the panel on this question, because I know that we don't have a lot of time, but I want to give a little more voice here and then I'll tie it off. 
Um, Mark, I wouldn't mind giving one little, not advice, but a response that I've seen a lot happen, happen throughout our schools is how close, your school has chosen a curriculum. So just if you stay close to it and stay close to that book that you're following, just keep it simple. Keep your parents involved. As a mother of kids, when I didn't, when I don't know what pages, what chapter I'm on, when I don't know what the basic knowledge is, then I can't help my kids. So, you know, just have a good um, master lesson plan and share it in advance. Share with your parents. Your parents are here to help you. And that's why a good communication is crucial. The LMS is very important, but also talk to those other teachers which are at home with the kids and give them the tools to flip those pages and create little globes and volcanoes and do those experiments at home because that's where it happening that's where the most learning happens is at home when they're with when they're um doing what they worked at school or in their virtual classroom so just use those allies i guess that's that would be my my little uh, grain here thank you thank you blake any Final thoughts from your side. I would just tie off, uh, perhaps I could talk about kind of emphasis on relational learning. I could talk about in, engaged learning and the pedagogies that lead to that, tend to lead to that, such as inquiry. But what I really would emphasize is that in this environment where we've sent a lot of people online, teachers and students, that there is a real role now um, in authentication of information, that students uh, have so much information before them uh, that they uh, are led to experience the power behind how information gets made and how information gets changed. And so uh, there's room for parent education and student education, and sadly even for teacher education sometimes on um, the sources of information and the differences between um, whether something is not peer reviewed and not published or whether something is peer reviewed but not published or whether something is published and it's peer reviewed. And uh, I think we really need to take uh, uh, special emphasis these days on digital literacy. So, you know, there's scratching the surface and then there's not even coming close to scratching the surface. Uh, I would call B, option B on today. You, you recognize that we could spend a whole day, we could have a week long symposium on this conversation and, and get it broken down uh, even further with significance. And, you know, we appreciate your audience. We thank everyone for being a part of this. and. Frankly, I really do think that getting connected to people of authority is part of what will help us to be genius going forward. Now, I've been a part of this industry my whole career and been involved in what I'm doing now for almost two decades. And I will tell you uh, that there are schools that are and will continue to thrive under these circumstances. And then there are schools that will not. We have already seen school truncation, school closure, school consolidation. We have this dilemma. And frankly, I think that we've got to be connected to people that really do have authority that understand what it is that we need to be doing that will allow us to be successful. So you, you've met Michael, you've met Blake, you've met Corolla. They have their unique expertise and focuses and things in common. And we want to be of help to you. If we can be of help to you, uh, if there are topics that you want us to spend more time on, we can certainly come back and, and, and really just focus on an item, an area of greater interest. But uh, today, it's really been our pleasure to be a part of this. I know Radwa and Nadine and the team at Edupedia reminded me uh, that it is important for everyone that's involved here today to understand, again, what we're doing at FACTS. And if we can be of help to you, we have schools that are actually embracing our um, solutions uh, as we speak uh, and are in need of infrastructure. And so we're helping them through this phase by waiving our uh, student subscription fees for our services until April 1st. So just keep that in mind. And if you are doing what I think every school should be doing right now, which is auditing, auditing their infrastructure, 
auditing their instructional practices and really doubling down on what their renewed mission looks like so that we can be viable. Because at the end of the day, all of this whole discussion is about what really matters and that is the learner. We want our learners to be successful, thrive, actualize and uh, become uh, what they can become to contribute to uh, our future. Uh, that, is, that is the privilege that we have in all of this. So thank you, and uh, we appreciate everyone's time and listening today, and Rod, we'll turn it back to you. Thanks a lot, Mark, and thanks everyone. It was such a pleasure to have you on board, and the session was um, a very insightful and helpful one, actually. Um, uh, actually, I think a lot of people are having uh, questions and they are sharing uh, a lot of what they want to know on Hoover, so uh, it would be great if you can answer them back and so on. Uh, by, uh, if you have any questions or final thoughts that you would like to ask us, Mark, or any one of the panelists, we would like to, um, to be here for you. And um, by now we are uh, ending our day, but uh, Dr. Nibin is going to uh, give us a wrap up, a quick wrap up of uh, the whole day and what has been uh, done so far, so that we can uh, be prepared for uh, today, Educators Resilience. And uh, so please, Dr. Nimin, can you give us uh, a, a quick wrap up for the day? Okay, very much, Radu. I would like really to thank the, the panel of facts today. It was really, really informative. Thank you very much for uh, your talk today. It was really very informative. Thank you very much. Well, My let pleasure. Me give you a very, uh, thank you, Mark. Nice to see you again. Me, you uh, also. Let me, very, yeah. <laughs> Let me give you a very quick idea about the day today. We started at the beginning of the day trying to seize uh, some opportunities from the distant learning and what we're learning uh, in our journey into teaching and learning uh, because the day was speaking about designing learning, uh, how to sustain what we already gained and how to really uh, open up for, other, for new ideas. Then we had like breakout sessions uh, John Redley was speaking about the curriculum and uh, he was asking uh, actually very hard questions to be able to design or redesign curriculums for uh, the case we are in today. He spoke about what is important, is it concept on knowledge, what is learning and how we can uh, focus on what's important and redesign our curriculums. Uh, Dr. Nuna Yunus was speaking, she was the Arabic session, she was speaking about humanizing learning and a relationship with students, keeping the involvement and keeping uh, students engaged and how we can do this. She gave us actually a very nice acronym. I hope that uh, people who attended this session would remember this. This is in Arabic. Uh, she identified if you can all remember. Uh, it's a nice way to remember what the session was all about. Uh, we had also uh, John Almaro, uh, and he was speaking about, he gave us some practices, like retrieval practices, engaging emotionally, and very specific ideas and very practical ones actually about how to keep our students engaged and how to make sure that they um, take the content or really uh, acquire the content. Um, we also had, of course, um, um, Anne Tonneson, Carol, she was speaking about uh, a very specific ideas of, again, specific about how to teach reading, but I like very much how she ended the session at the end. She said, be there, connect, um, uh, be good to students and be good to yourself. I like very much how she ended it because lots of teachers actually are having a very tough time trying to get through where we are. Uh, finally, of course, we added with this wonderful panel, um, wrapping everything up, making sure that we have the infrastructure of how we can get in connection with students because, uh, as you identified, uh, active learning, uh, teaching and learning is all about interaction and connection and how we can keep this happening and how we can have the tools for it. Uh, also, the panel gave us a few examples about what's happening around the world and that was very important actually. Um, here and there, Asia and uh, North America. We also had a very good provision of what could happen in the future and to make sure that this is not something that's going to end soon. So we better really get up and uh, make sure that we are 
uh, facing it properly. And uh, I think that uh, all what was said actually were, was pouring on in the same like uh, idea of how we can um, make ourselves and others uh, um, ready for the coming time because of our students and how we care for students and how we make them learn. Uh, I really thank very much all the speakers of today and I thank this panel for ending the day and wrapping it up with uh, putting our fingers on what really should be done. Uh, thank you very much everybody and um, I hope that tomorrow also you're going to be there, all participants be there uh, early. Uh, we will be very happy to see you again. We have a new day tomorrow with uh, a new idea. Uh, today we'll speak about designing learning, but tomorrow we're going to speak about teachers' resilient, resilience, and, and this is a topic that we all really need to focus on and have some ideas about. Thank you very much, everybody, and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naveen. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.